Yes, so, welcome. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. So I've been a computational researcher for 15 years in many different fields. About five years ago, I joined my current team. And now, basically, my focus is on usability and teaching of the computing. So basically, making it where people can actually use all the resources we provide. So I'm part of Alto Scientific Computing, which is the name of our team within Alto University. We're a small team, like nine people. We don't really operate on a large scale, but we are very close to the researchers. Basically, we're distributed and we share coffee rooms with the people that use our services. And it should note, if you know Finland, you probably know CSC. We are not part of CSC. And we don't even have as much interaction with them as we would like. Basically, they're big and, well, we're not large enough to be, to have a strong role there. Okay, so what's the big picture? So I've phrased, framed this term crisis of computing. So basically, the idea is that, well, people need, almost anyone needs computing. And researchers arrived, they tend to arrive to our courses and our infrastructure unprepared for the work. So an easy solution that some people can use is say, well, you know, we're the HPC cluster. If you don't do real HPC, this isn't what you need. But that doesn't work for us. So we need to focus on everyone doing their work. So we've got different things here. We have a training series, which you can read about more yourself. We have a online course, which is more like a roadmap of all the different things you might need to know to build yourself up from what you might learn in academic courses to using the cluster. So as I've said before, using a cluster is not that difficult when you know how to use the shell really well. If you don't know how to use the shell well, then, well, it's almost impossible, and so on and so on. So basically, it's all about the basics here. Lately, we have a research software engineer service, which I think takes a complementary role here. So not everyone needs to do everything themselves. So we can sort of export some of the problems to uh, professionals who can work with the researchers. So in, uh, well, a few years ago, we started this Kickstart course, a few being maybe 2014 or so, I'm not entirely sure. And it's been continually refined over time. So. It's sort of a starting point of new users for our cluster. We recommend everyone to take it. And these days it's not really focused on the high performance so much, but on the computing part. So most people, if you need to use large MPI programs or even write large MPI programs, uh, you can probably figure that out yourself or use any many of the other good training courses that are available. But the biggest problem is that people come and they start to use the cluster and you don't know Linux or Shell or whatever like that and you just can't get started. So our typical contents these days is the first day is sort of general lecture-ish kind of things like a crash course about what does HPC and computing even mean, about the Linux shell, like what are the different workflows that are even available to do your computing, cluster or otherwise or guest talks from other people like CSC. And then days two and three is how to actually use the cluster. Okay, um, so when we got to a year ago and everyone everything went remote, I immediately realized that this is a great thing because we're closer to everyone else in the world. So it's easier to share things. So for our summer kickstart course, we said, well, why not open it to everyone else in Finland? So we did. And there's different advantages and disadvantages here. The disadvantage is that the examples don't necessarily work out of the box everywhere else. But we sort of worked on that by trying to standardize our clusters a little bit. So it's not at the level of different courses for every different site, but we tried to make one course that reasonably worked between all of the Finnish sites, excluding CSC, for the reason stated above. So the advantage is that even if we didn't have the effort to generalize this to all the courses and make it seamless, it's still a resource that the other places just didn't have and realistically wouldn't have the staff to have in the near term. 
And most of the, what I think important messages of the course are sort of independent of the cluster. Like if you see how to run a array job somewhere, it's not that hard to understand the concept and use it somewhere else if you know the Linux shell and other things to do the scripting. So yeah, so uh, last summer we did it joint with other communities. Then in February of this year, we took this a bit further and made it with the MOOC strategy, which I'll explain next. And then um, in July, oh uh, yeah, and then in July this year, we continued that and really showed that it was seamless and scaled quite well. So you can see our pipeline here. We had many people registered and quite high retention overall. Okay, um, so what's our current teaching strategy? So a lot like Code Refinery with the online courses, which is not a like small 10 or 20 person workshop like Carpentries, but we've managed to scale this to um, 100 people pretty well by distributing things into breakout rooms. And then we have lectures, which is where we ex show demos and explain what to do, and then breakout rooms where people work. So in the Kickstart course, we don't actually have this here. So in the Kickstart course, it's actually um, like sort of the lectures and demos and type alongs, and then people working themselves with uh, mentoring and help when people ask for it. And that's mainly because we can't get enough helpers like we can in Code Refinery. So I think there's different levels of people we're talking to. So some people are new and they're fine with just watching passively. So you sort of need to like watch and see the course and see the whole thing. And then maybe next time you can dive in a little bit more. So expecting everyone to be hands-on is too much. Some people are about ready and want to do all the examples and the course is about on target for them. Some are quite advanced and want to move forward quickly. Another important thing is co-teaching. So we basically say you should never teach alone. So in the small courses, the idea is that you have the teacher and the learners and the teacher should have a discussion with the learners, but that doesn't really work in the giant courses. So in Code Refiner, we have a hundred people and you can't like, basically the audience didn't talk with you. So instead we have two teachers and the teachers are talking with each other. And you can read here if you would like to know how it works in practice. And this basically makes it seem interactive and work very well. And we have HackMD for questions, which I forgot to introduce, but I guess I can introduce now. So here, which I will put in the Zoom chat, is the HackMD. And you can ask a question such as like this, and then you will get answers like this. And this is basically better than voice because multiple people can talk at the same time and you don't have to try to speak over each other in order to like get a time to ask the question. And it's better than the Zoom chat because, well, it's sort of asynchronous and you can go back and answer in different orders. So this basically lets any course scale and become super interactive. Okay, so the tech setup, this is where it gets interesting. So when we're teaching to 200 people, we don't do that in one Zoom meeting. First off, there's no need to, and it doesn't really work. So the basic idea is this. There's one instructor Zoom meeting here, which you have the instructors and some certain helpers and the production crew and so on, and learners are not there. Instead, it's captured with open broadcasting software, which is what I'm doing now, and then it's live streamed to the whole world via Twitch. So basically anyone who wants can sign up for it and watch and see, and there's no risk of it affecting anyone else. I mean, isn't it sort of interesting that as soon as we go to remote work, we have the possibility for anyone in the world to attend our events and we immediately learn, okay, we should never ever share a Zoom link because something bad might happen. Why not have both? This provides that. So then there's a learner Zoom and the learners independently watch the Twitch stream or it can be shared within the Zoom meeting. And then there the learners work and like do the examples and talk with the helpers and mentors and then give us feedback via this HackMD. And then we see that and respond and 
comment back on the stream, and so on. So the general flow goes, we'll talk a little bit, we'll give an example and say, okay, now it's your turn. And then we say, okay, you'll have 15 minutes. And then we announce it, we mute the stream, and then the stream goes off and can work alone in this uh, learner room. And then we, since the stream is muted, we have our instructor space to talk and plan out the next strategy without interfering with all of the other learners, which is really great. It hides the back channel talk some. So as you notice here, I'm sharing Zoom with a portrait screen share. I think this is a very important thing. So it basically means that we have half the screen for us and our examples and half the screen for people to work along and do their own thing. Um, yeah, so even in this meeting, you're probably gonna be, you're probably doing something else at the same time you're listening to me. So why not make it easier for, for you to do that? So it's easy to give the attention to me instead of minimizing this landscape screen where everything's too small and you have to make it full screen to fit anything. This is really great. So a typical learner layout would look like this here, where half the screen is the share and half the screen is available. And well, we mix in the uh, instructors talking via the OBS, Open Broadcaster Software. So what are some advantages of the setup? So, well, you can see one of the feedbacks we got from some users here. And basically, um, well, I like it a lot. And it seems that some other people like it a lot too. I see little reason to try to go back to another kind of strategy. And I even think it's so good that I don't really see how we can get something that's as useful within the, um, when we go back to in-person courses. Mm, let's see. And yes, I will publish the questions and answers later if there's anything useful there. Okay, so what are the advantages? So HackMD is a much better tool for answering questions. Um, and oh yes, so yeah. So the HackMD, since there's no personal data there, can be shared and we put it on the course website or make it available. Also, since the learners are not in the, um, not in the same Zoom meeting, there's zero chance of privacy risk here. So we can immediately release the videos. We can allow anyone to watch without giving out this Zoom link publicly. Um, let's see. The videos are available for an instant replay. So Twitch records it for 14 days and then it gets on YouTube soon. Which I mean, when you have a course like this, everything you do in the course, I mean, that's not really enough. Like, do we really expect someone to learn what we're teaching? in the three hours we have in one day. So no, I don't think that's really possible. So we need to mix these different strategies. There's a live thing where we talk, there's the written material, there's the recordings later. And this also makes it really great, easy for someone to catch up if they get behind. The instructor back channel doesn't interfere with the learners. So in the original code refinery courses, when we're going in breaks or exercises, then the instructors are discussing, oh, what do we do next? Now it's great, we can sort of just mute it and then we plan ourselves and the instructor workload is much less. People say that the team teaching is much more engaging than trying to get these overloaded learners to um, get, um, get engaged in it. And I think the course is just overall a lot more fun to give. So what are the disadvantages? So, well, when you try to scale too much for something like HPC, there's problems with incompatible sites. So we got a lot of feedback about this, but when discussing it, then other people come up and say, yeah, like maybe it doesn't work, but um, this is still much better than anything we had. So just keep going at it. So the tech takes some getting used to both for the other instructors and for the learners. Um, yeah, but I mean, everyone got used to it pretty well after you saw a few examples. So I think that this is not really a big concern. And I, uh, when we went to remote work, I took some time to upgrade my home desktop computer and made it where it was able to 
like pr prepared it for these kinds of things. And as you can see here, it's slowly grown into this massive setup um, with the, um, let's see. So with the, this is the code refinery setup and it was a bit more complicated. With the current setup, you need one less screen to do it well, but I think you could even do it with two screens or something like that. And really this is to the point where when we go back to the office, I don't think I can run this from work. I have to have my home set up in order to do this. So what are some future prospects here? Um, we'll probably keep going with this strategy for our large courses, at least the really biggest ones. And there's really no reason not to invite the whole world to attend. Um, other people want to take part, they can simply provide the uh, Twitch link and they can say, okay, you can, no, you can watch this course it may be useful, it may not be. You'll probably learn something. You'll have to go and use our docs to fill in missing gaps, but at least you get the big picture. You can make your own Zoom meeting with for your own breakout rooms. So basically, as one of my colleagues said, it's like a TV production. So we have the studio, we produce it for the world, and then there's all the different people that are, are in the different theaters or classrooms or audiences, and then they watch it separately, and then, um, you know, during the commercial breaks, then say, okay, now let's talk among ourselves. Okay, now let's go back and so on and so on. Also, I think rather than making the courses different or customizing the courses different things, why not try to standardize clusters more? Of course, this is an almost impossible task because of the independence of um, sysadmins of different sites, but you know, maybe we can make a generic course which has the basics and say, okay, we expect that your cluster can work with this course. Um, let's see, other things in the future. So yeah, is the course generic or localized? Um, do we continue sort of like we had where we had some generic days and then some uh, days where each site has their own program running on. Can we combine more internationally? Is Code Refinery platform for this? These are all good possibilities here. So let's look at these questions here while I had some other last minute things I wrote down. So yeah, I think that the usability is as important as the training. If something is hard to teach, then maybe we need to make it more usable. Uh, let's see. So this is a part of the big training courses. And also I think that the courses are not the end all strategy here. So I really, like I said above, I think I really don't think that a single course is enough to have everyone learn things. So instead of forcing a whole course into a few days and expecting this is enough, I think we have to have a course which is reasonably good enough and scaled enough, like sort of what we're doing here, and then good local support. So the person is really going to learn HPC by, um, by asking their colleagues or their local support for mentoring in these like small little things that they're working on as you're working it on. Okay, let's see. Mm, what's the backup plan? So, well, so our backup plan so far has been if the streaming setup breaks, then the instructors join the published Zoom meeting for the learners with the breakout rooms and then teach there. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, so I think that we need to make this where other people can use the setup pretty easily. So we're not quite there yet in part because I'm still refining it, but I think we're slowly getting there and when someone has time, they'll be able to do it without too much effort. Um, yeah, Sima had a point here about, like it really does sort of centralize most of the tech setup to one person and that actually means that we can take a lot more instructors in. So specialization is okay. Um, yeah. How does course evaluation work? So by having HackMD, which is continually having questions like this, then the instructors can get a continual pulse of how people are asking questions and how it's going. We can have feedback 
um, we can say, okay, how would you, like, how does this feedback work? Uh, like, how's this going? And we ask people to give the feedback into HackMD, and everyone can. We have pulls via HackMD, and so on. Um, and my time is running a bit low here. Um, but, yeah, I think that's the general point. So I guess in summary, I sort of see that the goal with the teaching should not be to take the training courses we would do in person and make them online, but sort of have a new strategy. Like we have to have a whole new concept of running the courses online. And then we can reach far more people and fill in a gap. And then we redesign how we learn and mentor in person and small. So what's the instructor participant ratio? So in the Kickstart course, we had 200 learners or so, and then maybe, maybe five to 10 helpers on a typical day during the course within the learner room. So these were answering questions from learners. And we would have a few from our site, a few from the other sites within Finland. And then for instructors, there was basically me and then one or two other instructors for most of the time. So the scaling is just amazing here. Mm, yeah, but well, the downside is it's not a one-on-one -on -one thing like the Carpentries does. So, okay, with that being said, I will stop my uh, screen share here and go back to Zoom. So yeah, for anyone that's watching the recording later, thanks for listening.